exalt him above his creation. Nahmiduhu, we then attribute this praise to Allah, and we recognize that his praise is something that is infinite, limitless, and something that we can't completely grasp, especially in the context of the human being being so qasir, the human being being deficient. But yet still, Allah, through his mercy, he sends rusul. He sends us messengers to extend that divine hand to then teach us about himself, to then teach us, to inspire us, to give us the ilham, to show us the way to give us the light, to give us the nur, to give us the nur of Quran, nur al nubuwa the light of prophecy, to show us the way. So we praise Allah with a particular sort of praise that has presence with it that we understand what this means, the significance of praising Allah and understanding that alhamd, the praise, but also with a sense of shukr, thankfulness. We also recognize, it, recognize that it's a fundamental aspect of the human being that we must praise Allah for our own benefit, our own good, this sort of praise, right? Uh, the phrase in Arabic, alhamdulillahi alladhi, alhamdulillahi, hamdan yuafi ni'amahu wa yukafi mazida. So we praise Allah in a way that we recognize also His blessings upon us. His blessings, for example, that we gather here and to remember His name, we praise Allah in that regard. We also praise Allah in a way that will bring about healing, that will heal our communities, that will bring about a level of unity and foster love and compassion between the believers, this sort of praise. Praise that's heartfelt. Not a praise that's just like, alhamdulillah. No, a praise that you feel it in your heart and it resonates in your being. We live in a day and age where people say all sorts of things and sometimes we say things we're not thinking about what we say. So as we gather here now to praise Allah's name, let's reflect on some of these meanings. That sort of praise where we're saying Alhamdulillah, praising Allah's name, but also thinking about it the same exact time Allah's blessings upon us. Blessings that not everybody enjoys in the world that some people don't have a roof over their heads. Some people don't have AC. Some people don't even have security and peace. They don't have these things. And these things are ni'am of Allah upon us that we then have to praise His name for. And this is the sort of praise that then brings the community together, makes the community vibrant, makes it grow, and makes it lead. Kuntum khayra ummati ukhrijat nas. You are the best of nations brought up for the people. So we want to praise Allah with that sort of praise that makes us the best of nations. Allah gave us this particular name in the Quran. We have to then accept that moniker. The Prophet, he calls our nation Al-Hammadun. The people often praising Allah, remembering his name too often. Hammadun, always remembering Allah's name. But not just saying it, living it. Feeling it, experiencing the praise of Allah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu, we seek his aid in even praising him like this. And we also recognize, we also say Alhamdulillah, subhanAllah, the scholars, they mentioned that when you say Alhamdulillah, say it again. So Alhamdulillah, thumma Alhamdulillah. We hear this often in the khutab, right? Alhamdulillah, thumma Alhamdulillah. Why do we say that? The reason being, because you were given the tawfiq, Allah gave you the success to say the hamd the first time, so you say thumma alhamdulillah, that Allah gave you the ability to say it the first time. Because tawfiq, wa ma tawfiq illa billah, the tawfiq is only by way of Allah, through Him, by Him, and with Him, and by the way of the sunnah of His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiru, we seek His forgiveness. Because of course we often have this qusul, we have these shortcomings, these deficiencies, we have sins that we often want to repent from. We want to atone for these sins, we want to heal. So we want to praise Allah in a manner that we heal as people, heal as individuals, as families and as communities. SubhanAllah, we live in an age where we are, we are a people who are traumatized, but so traumatized we're not able to recognize the trauma. Unfortunately, it's only when something, when a catastrophe descends that we recognize, oh, we have some issues. When unfortunately maybe somebody goes and joins the Islamic State of whatever and does a suicide bombing, oh, we have an issue, we have a problem that we have to solve. No, the problem was all, always there. The trauma, the sicknesses were already there that Allah calls us in the Quran to heal from, to fix these things, to take the spiritual medicine, that we look to fix ourselves, that we look to answer His call, and answer His call in a way that it's going to give us life. 
and give us this shifa, this healing. So we want to live inside these meanings and think about these meanings when we say Alhamdulillah and we seek and, and end in seeking Allah's aid and saying Alhamdulillah. These are the meanings that we have to think about on, in the Jum'ah. This is what the Jum'ah is for that we gather basically as a people around these meanings. Thinking about this thing, th doing tadabbur of these meanings. What is the tadabbur? What is the pondering? The pondering and the tadabbur in the Arabic language, it means that you look at a thing on the surface. So you see Alhamdulillah on the surface, the praise of Allah on the surface, but you don't stop there. You don't stop there, you get meta metaphysical, right? So you see the law here of a thing, the surface of a thing. You go beyond the surface. You become a person who is rooted in the, in the spiritual nutrition of Islam. Become a person who sees through the surface of affairs and you see the deeper meanings to things. And then that's where the healing takes place. This is where you're gonna find Allah's name, as shafi the healer, the one who gives you the cure. Also Al-Qawi, and also Al-Mu'iz, the person who gives you the cure, and also gives you might. That he gives you strength, quwa baqa dha'fin. He gives you a quwa, a power, and empowerment after maybe you were weak, after maybe your faith was down. And so this is the sort of praise that we're looking for, and this is what the sort of praise that we're looking to gather on the day of Juma to celebrate these praises. When a'udhu billahi min shuri anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina, we then seek Allah's refuge from the evil of ourselves and the evil things that we involve ourselves in. That we know these things are evil, but we have shortcomings, we have these weaknesses. And this happens as a result of what we call ihmalun nafs. We sort of let ourselves sort of become either whether at that being lazy or just forgetting the fara'id, forgetting our prayers and doing them late and so on and so forth. When you do this, you open up yourself to the shandru nafs. That the nafs is like an animal that has to be trained. You have to treat it properly. You have to train yourself and discipline yourself and do diana to nafs. Treat yourself by way of the religion and have a sort of self-discipline and get, get to know your Lord and go to, to your Lord and come to know Him by praising His name. Of course, it's the khutbah al-haja. The Prophet here, subhanAllah, in his words, the Prophet says, the reason why we're doing an extended sharh, an extended explanation, I often do this, is because with the Prophet's words, he says, He says that I've been giving the most concise sort of speech, but it's fully encompassing of all sorts of meanings. The meanings are like endless when you stop and think about the Prophet's words. It's, that's the case with the Quran, but it's also the case with the Prophet's words. So here, the Prophet, it's like the Prophet is speaking to us right now and giving us remedies for all the social ills that we have in his hadith. So it then behooves every single Muslim to stop, think, ponder what the Prophet's telling us, especially if the Prophet says something more than once. Usually he says it three times. What about the Prophet begins every single lecture with saying the same exact thing? It means really I gotta pay attention to this. I need to give it credence. I need to stop and ponder it. So the Prophet would, would then say, we then seek Allah's refuge from the evil of ourselves, but also the evil of our deeds that results later on. That when you sort of have the ihmal al nafs, when you forget about yourself, you forget about your, your prayer, maybe you have some weakness in iman, maybe you're forgetful. We all fall into shortcomings. But we have to recognize that there is a, with, with our shortcomings and with our turning away from what Allah told, called us to, there's a spiritual pollution that develops from that. Spiritual pollution, right? Missing prayers and so on and so forth. This gives rise to something that maybe you don't see it yet, but it's having an effect upon your heart, right? But there are unseen affairs within you that you have to pay attention to. The Prophet, he speaks about this Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he says that the heart, the human heart, إِذَا صَلُحَ صَلُحَ الْيَسَرُ كُلُّهُ That the human heart, the spiritual and also the physical heart, if it becomes sound, then the entire body will then be sound. The human being will have serenity. The human being will, will do what's right. But if you leave the heart, and you leave the nurture, if you leave the nurturing of the heart with the spiritual, the adkar, the prayers, the Quran, and so on and so forth, if you leave the heart, it'll then become facid. It'll become black. So much is the case that if a person commits a sin in the hadith, right, sahih hadith, a person commits a sin, a black spot, a spot appears. If he does the istighfar, then it becomes a race. Similarly, the angel on the right hand, the left hand. The angel on the right hand wants to see you do good deeds and writes the good deeds, right? 
The angel on the left hand, when you do a bad deed, he writes down the bad deed and waits for you to repent. Then if you repent, he erases it. May yahdi Allahu fala mudilla la. Whoever Allah guides, there's no misguider for him. Wa may yudlilhu fala hadi la. And whoever Allah misguides, there's no guider for him. Wa ashhadu Allah ilaha illa Allah wa ahdahu la sharika la. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. We then now take the time to testify that Allah is one. He has no partner. He has no associate. But again, here in the Qutbah al-Hajjah, we want to give it some more thought. The, the, the fact is, this may be, maybe it's, it's novel to some to give so much time just to, you know, explaining some words, quote unquote. As I think that's an issue in our age, we think words are some, we think, we don't give words their proper due. Words are powerful. Words are powerful. Study words, study language. Language defines our being. Language can make or break you. Right? This is the Sahara of the Islamic spiritual tradition that we have to tap into. It's called Islamic metaphysics. Islamic spirituality, it's, it's not really not that complex. It's, it's in the Quran where Allah talks about, for example, Allah says, uh, Allah tells us, He commands us to seek refuge in His words, the Quran. And there are other, other, other prophetic narrations where you say certain words and they're a protection for you for your entire day. Me, the point is to say words are powerful. Bad words are powerful, good words are powerful. And then focusing, focusing on words and their meanings, there's a power in that for the believers to take advantage of. So speaking about la ilaha illallah now, and this shahada, this is a shahada of course that every single human being was created to testify to. And this is a, this is a shahada, if we want to break it down, so the khutbah is really about today, breaking down the shahada metaphysically and understanding what's going on beyond the surface of me just saying the shahada. What does it mean? So first the shahada starts off with the negation. You start off negating something. Some people would say the shahada actually begins with atheism. Right? But you're saying, La ilaha, right? there's no God. Well, with atheism, but, but finish. Illa Allah, then you affirm Allah is the one Lord. But it's even deeper than that though. Because when you say this, La ilaha illallah, effectively what you're doing to your heart is you're taking out everything that buys and is, is in competition and contradiction with La ilaha illallah. So it's like you're doing the, the, the you're basically doing the Umran al qalb just like when you're building a, a building, you built this message, you have to first, for example, dig down and you get rid of rocks, dig up roots and so on and so forth, right? You have to basically prepare the earth for then introducing Allah to it. The understanding of Allah free from shirk, free from competing interests, free from the problems of the age. So this is what the, this, this shahada does for the human being. He's a human, a, a human being and the, the human heart Primarily a protection from much of the evil that exists in the world today. And a lot of and, and all those things that are in competition with La ilaha illallah. But we talked about trauma. And we think this trauma, subhanAllah, we think that trauma is only physical. That a person, for example, slaps you upside the head. Oh, this is I was traumatized. No, the deeper sort of trauma, it's in the realm of the of the war for hearts and minds. That nowadays we're being traumatized and fed ideas that are traumatic and we don't even know it. We're being fed atheism, e evolutionism, existential, all different sorts of names that maybe you, sh you can know or not know, it doesn't matter. The reality is that we are being bombarded by things that are deeply rooted in kufr, disbelief. And that the shahada gives you a bulwark, it gives you a means of, it gives you a defense mechanism, a spiritual defense mechanism ag against that batil, against those shuru this shurur. And this is the short of shuru that we should pay attention to. Every single evil in the world, every single war, fitan, every single uh, calamity that happens, it's usually rooted in a corrupt heart. That a heart is attached to kufr, and then it does, does corruption in the earth. So the bombing of masajid, the bombing of this, and these different wretched actions that people do in the earth, it's rooted in the heart. Basically, if the heart is sound, if the heart, excuse me, if the heart is somehow weak or compromised, then those actions will be compromised and compromising, that the facade will spread in the earth. So we then want to understand the kalimat of tawheed in this regard. Understand that when you say la ilaha illallah, you are first negating something from here. You're taking something out. You're getting rid of something, you're getting rid of something that's dark and then introducing light. 
Then, you, then we say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You then introduce Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam into the equation. And understanding that without him, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we don't understand La ilaha illallah. We don't understand the religion. Without him, we don't understand Tawheed, we don't understand, we don't come to know Allah at all without Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah in the second khutbah, we'll go into the second half of the shahada, shahada, inshallah ta'ala. وقولوا قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فسيفوز المستغفرين استغفروا انه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم. So we're speaking about, of course, the kalim to shahada and how it transforms the human, transforms the human being. We want to see how this transform, transformation takes place in real time. We have real time sources to look at and study to see how this kalimat of tawheed, this metaphysical reality, then becomes physical, or how a statement is transformative and how it transforms the hearts, hearts of a nation, right? how, it, how, heart, how it transforms these hearts. So the first immediate source to look in these regards is, of course, the seerah. So you look at the seerah to see how this la ilaha illa transformed the companions, right? How they just simply said this statement, they praised Allah and how it changed their lives. Right? And all, all sorts of stories in the seerah but, uh, that we don't maybe have so much time to go into. But suffice it to say that the Prophet gives us a flowchart and the Quran gives us a particular mind map. Right? It gives us a map to ourselves, a map, a blueprint to the heart and how we can make our hearts work properly, how we can heal ourselves, how we, bec we can become a people who are once again dominant in the earth doing good in the earth, spreading compassion, love, mercy, care in the earth. Basically the opposite of what we see going on in the news right now. This is the sort of, this is the, what the shahada is supposed to do. Bring about love, mercy, care, first and foremost. Some people have you know, strange ideas about what the kalimah of the shahada is for. Some people think it's meant to, oh, for you to you know, take over that country or to make this amount of money or so on and so forth. The kalimah to tawheed is first and foremost for the transformation of the human being. For making the human being the khalifatullah al al That you're supposed to represent Allah upon the earth by way of this statement, recognizing this statement, living this statement, celebrating this statement. So we have in the seerah a really, really beautiful event, right? The, the Prophet, he shows us how our success as a nation, it's based in a, in a robust spirituality, first and foremost. It shows, he teaches, the, the, the seerah teaches us that. A beautiful spirituality, a human spirituality, first and foremost. The seerah teaches us this. So we have in, of course, shortly, try to keep it short here, we have in Mecca, and we know in Mecca, what was taught? Primary thing that was taught in Mecca was La ilaha illallah, to the extent that many of the ahkam, or the rulings that we have in Islam, for example, five daily prayers, the Soma Ramadan, the things that we come to sort of define Islam as right now, right? If you ask somebody, oh, what is Islam? Right, they immediately they're gonna tell you the five daily prayers and so on and so forth, you get into these physical actions. Actually, at the beginning of Islam, and what underpins the religion is actually something called Iman. And in many of the hadith, the Prophet gives precedence to Iman over Islam. Islam meaning physical actions. That Iman, first and foremost, is rooted in the heart. And then how you see Iman on a person that you see in his actions, but it starts with the heart, this is the point. It starts with the spiritual heart, first and foremost. So in Mecca, what we see is the Prophet focuses on la ilaha illallah. He focuses on teaching about Allah, teaching about the akhirah, teaching about the angels, educating the, the companions in these regards. That they become spiritual beings of the highest caliber, people firm in their religion, <clears throat> firm in understanding the world around them, and then Medina is established. So in this, uh, the narrative of the seerah, we also have a particular event, the Battle of Badr. Very, very important event. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet وسلم, he comes out with his companions in the Battle of Badr, about 314 people. The Meccans, they come out and they have about 3,000 approximately. Three times the number, or excuse me, 10 times the number. 
to the extent that you would say this is a rock, it's over. So Abu Jahl, he sees the, the Abu Jahl, Amr bin Hisham, uh, he sees the, the, this army, but he still sends a scout. He sends a scout out to see basically, okay, what do they really have? Let's go investigate. Let's go see what they have physically. Let's go see what they have of arms, of money. What do they have? Let's go see. Right, but there's a secret here that we want to observe and pay attention to. So the scout, he goes out. The scout, he goes. And he sees, he sees one horse, one mule. And he sees like a ragtag army. He sees an, an army that most people would laugh at, right? And this is a, wallahi as Muslims, we have to do, again, we have to have a reorientation with Islam. And this is what this khutbah is intended to do, that we reorient ourselves to, the, to those things that really give us success. Sometimes we think what's going to give us success is money, a lot of people, you know, and so on and so forth. We want, like, we want just, <laughs> we, we, want, we want physicality. But the success in Islam we're saying here, what we want to highlight here, is that the success in Islam is rooted in spirituality slash metaphysicality. It's rooted in the spiritual realm, it's rooted in the heart. Right? This is what we want to highlight. So Amr ibn Hisham, he sends the scout. The scout goes, reports back to Amr ibn Hisham, Abu Jahl. The scout says that these people, 314 warriors, one horse, one mule, they don't look like they have much. But I'm experienced with these affairs, and I know that no people come out looking like that except, except that there's something that's below the surface. There's something else going on here. So I advise you, Abu Jahl, go back to Mecca. Take all your people, go back to Mecca. There's something below the surface here. The Muslims, they have something else. Maybe it can't be seen. Maybe you don't smell it or can't feel it, can't you know, count it. Right? We live in the age of quantity. We want to quantify everything. Right? SubhanAllah. Different topic in and of itself, age of quantity. We live in the age of quantity over quality. We live in the age of the aqidah of Abu Jahl. This is Abu Jahl, right? This is his. How many numbers do you have? How much people do you have? This is what's about for Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl. The prophet, the prophetic narrative, though, it's, it's something else. It's something more spiritual, something more profound, something more robust. Something that underpins this realm of physicality. Something that un access the antecedent, the precedent to that. That the precedent, precedent to success in this life is something spiritual. So the scout, he tells Abu Jahl, go home. Don't fight. <laughs> Abu Jahl says, what? I'm going to get some rope. I'm going to tie them up. Drag them all back to Mecca. Khalas. Not even going to fight them. <laughs> Abu Jahl, the arrogance, the, arrog arrog the mushrik, the quantifier. 300 people, that's it's over. And then, of course, the battle takes place. We know, we know what happened. Allah sends, Allah sees the Muslims. Of course, Allah has knowledge of the Muslims, and he also knows what the Muslim ha Muslims have in their hearts. And then Allah gives them that spiritual aid. Right? He gives them then that, that victory, that nasr. He gives them that victory. When everyone thought, oh, it's over, there's no way that they could win. But they win that battle in amazing fashion. Even non-Muslim historians, they're amazed at how the Muslim armies won better, won the other battles, and then Islam spreads to you know up towards Pal to Jordan slash Palestine, into Syria, in into the other lands of you know India and so on and so forth. How does Islam spread so fast? Is it by money? Is it by arms? Is it what is the secret? What is the secret? Really, what is the secret? That's what we're talking about right now. Understanding la ilaha illallah at a fundamental spiritual level, this is the secret. This is the way forward. It was the way of success in the past, and it's the way of success in the future. There was a famous ruler. He went to the people of Iraq. His name is um, Am, uh, Abdullah ibn Abi. Famous ruler that he was uh, put. He was appointed over Iraq at that time. Unfortunately, the Iraqis at that time, back then, there was a lot of trouble and turmoil in the area. He stood up and he told the people that there was nothing that was going to rectify this nation, fix this nation. There's nothing that's going to fix the latter part of this nation except what fixed the first part of it. This is to say that we as believers only have to tap into a true and tried methodology, a true and tried metaphysic. A metaphysic and understanding that connects you to Allah, connects you to the rest of creation, that makes you balanced, allows you to heal, allows you to see straight. Allows you to come to know your Lord and also know the world around you. <laughs> mind you and mind me, not understanding this message, this crucial message, 
is why we have all the problems in the world today. That's why we have an ocean of plastic in the Pacific Ocean. This is why, maybe you don't make the connection just yet, inshallah, inshallah, you'll make the connection. You'll see how people not understanding la ilaha illallah leads to the ozone being depleted. Wallahi al-azim. People not understanding their Lord and their place inside of creation, it leads to at least these sorts of calamities. It leads to COVID-19. We get the point. It leads to COVID-19, these mashakil in the earth. These things that Allah descends and COVID-19 and all the other calamities, they're meant as basic, subhanAllah says in the Quran, ظَهَرَ الْفَسَادُ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِي النَّاسِ لِيُذِيقَهُمْ بَعْضَ الَّذِي عَمِلُوا لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ At the facade, the harmful things, the COVID viruses, the bird flu virus that was there before, swine flu virus, all these different viruses, 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 calamities, Bigger hurricanes, man, I'm from Florida, hit, hit, being now hit by huge and you know, historically big storms now, right? So Allah sends these things, why? He allows us to taste some of what we have put forth ourselves. Some of the spiritual pollution that we put out there, we think that it's not going to come back. But it, no, it comes back. Because it's a sunnah of Allah, it's a way that Allah does things that He allows the human being to taste some of the bad, not just for its own sake, not that you just suffer. Not that people have, you know, ailments just for that its own sake. But that he made people turn around. Maybe say, maybe they say, maybe we did something wrong. Maybe they say, how can we fix it? Maybe they start to repent. They make atonement. They start to fix themselves. They start to get over their egos. They start to be, have a fork and another. They start to see further ahead. They start to come together as a people. They start to love one another. They start to care. They start to open their hearts to the guidance. You know, we mentioned these things because Allah, He talks about this sort of message and He said, this is the message that is it's the aqibah for the muttaqeen. That the final finality of this affair of life, of the different trials and the different, tri tri different tribulations, that the finality of that it will be success for the believers. COVID virus inclu included. It'll bring about a success for the believers. And the ulama, they speak about this es es eschatologically, basically as it concerns the affairs of the Day of Judgment. I don't want to go into that too much, but we should know that all of these things that we see in the world, you know, the fitan, the trials overseas, the warfare overseas, the different groups, factions, fighting, suicide bombings, that this will, Allah will basically allow us to traverse this. And if you have the proper iman, the proper nabra, and you turn back to your back to your Lord, it'll be a source of solace for you. It'll be a source of healing for you. That you'll make it through. But you have to put your trust in Allah, open your heart to the guidance, and also look to overcome your ego, to see past the sort of base desires, to turn back to Allah, to start doing our prayers on time, to start respecting our brothers, to start respecting the environment. These things, you know, this complete sort of religion, step by step, big tadarruj that we slowly but surely come as you are, grow as you like, this sort of message, right? So we ask Allah for his tawfiq, we ask Allah to give us success in understanding the message and calling to it properly.
يا اللهم اشف النشاد لا شفاء لا شفاء شفاء لا يغادر سقما ولا ألما. Although we ask you to heal us, Ya Allah, to heal us as individuals, as families, as communities. We ask you to allow us to heal nationally and globally, internationally, Ya Allah, that we come together as believers and we look to transform the discourse on faith and be an umbrella for the, the, all the peoples of the earth to represent you and to, and to do good upon the earth, to spread love and compassion upon the earth, and that we uh, are become a people that give victory to the deen of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma ja'alna mimman yansuru bina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah make us a woman for people who give victory, the ultimate victory to the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma a'ali kalimat al-haqti wa al-deen. Allah make the word of la ilaha illallah the highest and uppermost word that's said in the earth, Ya Allah. We ask you to forgive us for our shortcomings, to guide us, to bless us, and to forgive us, Ya Allah, and to join our hearts. Allahumma alif bayna qulubina wa stil awratina wa amin ru'atina wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sallallahu wa sallam wa qin salam wa sallam 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 wa s